time for radical candor? <laughs> I love that phrase. I think if you don't mind, I'll use it. Hillary Clinton, public and private. On the eve of a new book, her first one-on-one -on -one network interview with Diane Sawyer. You're not looking at me thinking, here she is asking these no, questions. No, because again. I knew you would. I knew you'd have to. Cameras in her Washington home for the first time. Nothing off limits. It matters. Age matters. Well, and what's the truth about what they told her about that health scare? The good news is. The bad news is. Tough. Revealing. Because that phrase that keeps getting you scripted, cautious. I'm done with that. I mean, I'm just done. What she really thinks about President Obama. Why did you lose? What happened on her watch as Secretary of State under attack over Benghazi? What difference at this point does it make? Did you miss the moment? to prevent this from happening. Her marriage now, and Monica Lewinsky resurfaces. Monica Lewinsky is back in the news. That's, you know, not something that uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about. Really? And the hardest choice she faces now, is there really any chance she won't run for president? Is the White House yours to lose? The public, the private. Tonight, Hillary Clinton talks about it all. The legacy of Hillary Clinton is... Here now, Diane Sawyer. Good evening and welcome to the interview with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Tonight, probably the most talked about woman in America, about to decide whether to run for president again and at this moment, heralded as the clear front runner over every other likely candidate. As you know, she has been standing center stage in this nation for 20 years. Polls showing she's one of the most admired people and powerful, but also polarizing. So we know all of you watching will have an opinion on who she really is, and we expect to be hearing from you throughout the night online. But as we sit down with her now, we begin as she did in her new book, Hard Choices. Six years ago, the end of the longest primary race in history, and candidate Hillary Clinton has just gone down in a shattering defeat. It was personally painful, a sense of real loss and disappointment. Well, this isn't exactly the party I planned, but I... My mother's crying. And my husband's looking very sad, and my daughter's looking very sad. Although we weren't able to shatter that highest, hardest glass ceiling this time, thanks to you, it's got about 18 million cracks in it. And I did feel like I had let people down. Honestly, a lot of women and girls who had invested their, uh, their hopes in me, but men and boys as well across the country. That was the heart of the suffering? It was. Depression? No, just a... Deep Never regret? Really, no, no, no that, that's not how I react. But Hillary Clinton, who had once seemed inevitable, was reeling, bruised, and beaten. As Barack Obama smiled that big smile. Why did you lose? I think because I really didn't um, have a good strategy for my campaign. I didn't plan it the right way. What do you mean? As um, a candidate who was already so well known, I don't think I ever said, yes, you, you may have known me for eight years, but I don't take anything for granted. I have to earn your support. You know, this, this is very personal for me. It's not just political. It's not and just political. I think my campaign got into gear, frankly, after I got so badly uh, beaten in Iowa. Uh, and I went to New Hampshire and just worked my heart out along with everybody who was supporting me. Too late? I think it was too late. And we now know from her new book that right after the defeat, she sped to a secret meeting with the winner. She was lying down in the back seat of a car hiding from the press. And she says that first meeting was like an awkward first date. And you had Chardonnay. California Chardonnay. <laughs> and it was like an awkward first date. Now, obviously, I had known him for several years, but the campaign was so intense, and our staffs and our, our supporters were, were really at odds with each other. I don't think we ever felt that way about each other. Oh, just, yes, you no, did. We, we, no, not really, Diane. Hillary, you I did just not, spoke, I did you not just say anything about minutes. Ronald Reagan. You said two you do, things. You, you talked spoke. about admiring Hillary, Ronald Reagan, sorry, and you talked about you the ideas of the Senator Republicans. I didn't what, talk about Hillary? Ronald Reagan. What can you say to the voters who seem to like Barack Obama more? Well, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> You're likable no. enough. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the book now reveals that in the first meeting between Obama and Clinton, they spoke of lingering resentments. How angry Bill Clinton was at what he thought was the preposterous charge of racism and how wearing it was for her. The constant attention to her clothes, her appearance. 
even though at the time she put on a brave face. I admire what Senator Clinton has done for America. Um, I'm not sure about that coat. <laughs> I actually like Hillary's jacket. I don't know what's wrong with it. Uh, I was not as effective calling it out during that campaign either because there is a double standard. We live with a double standard and people ought to think about their own daughters, their own sisters, their own mothers when they make comments about women in public life. Thank you for coming. I love your outfit. <laughs> Well, I love your outfit, well, but I thank you. do want the earrings back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tonight, at her home in Washington, Hillary Clinton says after 20 years in public life, she is finally living her own schedule, her own thoughts on her own terms. The polls may show her way ahead, but does she want to go through it again? She insists she hasn't made up her mind. Do you believe her? When are you going to decide whether you're running for president? <laughs> you know, I'm going to decide uh, when it feels right for me to decide because... Still um, by the end of this year? Well, you know, certainly not before then. I just want to kind of get through this year, travel around the country, help in the midterm elections in the fall, and then take a deep breath and kind of go through my pluses and minuses about what I will and, and will not uh, be thinking about as I make the decision. But probably not announced until next year? I'm not positive about that, but that's probably likely. We know all of the currents that right. might be driving you to say yes. Right. What is the strongest reason to say no? Well, because I really like my life. I like what I'm doing. I'm thrilled about becoming a grandmother in the fall. I have lots of hopes uh, for what that means uh, to me and my family. Can you savor being a grandmother and be president? Of course, men have been serving in that position, being fathers and grandfathers since the beginning of the Republic. But I want to know how I feel. I mean, you have one life to live. This is this is it. It's not a dress rehearsal. The women and girls, she says, were counting on her. Tonight, there is a Ready for Hillary Super PAC, which plays Katy Perry's Roar. It has raised six million dollars. And no other candidate is coming forward. So is it fair that while she decides she's in effect holding the party hostage? I am so appreciative of everybody who's encouraging me. I, I'm grateful that they have that confidence in me. Uh, but this is a really personal decision. I know it's a personal decision, but if you can do it, do you have to do it? I have to make the decision that's right for me and the country. But and is the party I have to make frozen it. in place waiting for you no, to No, I mean, no. People, people can do whatever they choose to do on whatever timetable they decide. Barbara Bush has said, enough with the Clintons and the Bushes, the Clintons <laughs> and the Bushes. Yeah. It's just getting silly, she said. Do you feel some of that? I don't, because this is, this is a democracy. People get to choose their leaders. Is the White House yours to lose? Well, I don't think so, because if I were to decide to pursue it, I would be working as hard as any underdog or any newcomer uh, because I don't want to take anything for granted if I decide to do it. And what does Thank she do all, about the God focus on her appearance that she says once kept her so on guard? Scripted, cautious, right. safe, well, but I think armored. Part, part of, and, I, and I understand why some people might have um, seen that or, or certainly attributed that because when you're in the spotlight as a woman, you know you're being judged constantly. I mean, it is just never ending. And you get a little, you know, worried about, okay, well, you know, people over on this side are loving what I'm wearing, looking like, saying, people over on this side aren't. And how, you know, your, your natural tendency is how do you bring people together so that you can better communicate? I'm done with that. I mean, I'm just done. You said you're just over it. You I are. am over it, over it. I think I have changed, not worry so much about what other people are thinking. And my view is I have lived an incredibly blessed life. I've had so many wonderful experiences. And I'm going to say what I know, what I believe, and let the chips fall. Time for radical candor? <laughs> I love that phrase. I think if you don't mind, I'll use it. Right. Well, but I think for me, it's, it's time. I don't know that I could have done it earlier because I was certainly trying to find my way. But what has not changed is the Republicans clearly think their big fight is against her. Republican powerhouse Karl Rove already tried to launch a salvo, saying he thought maybe she had ongoing effects from a kind of brain trauma. 
after that big headline-making fall last December, causing a concussion. How was your health? It's very good, thank you. How serious was it? It was, you know, it was, a, uh, I think, a serious concussion. Were you, you I had rested. trouble with vision? Because of the force of the, of the fall, I had... Some, I had double vision for uh, a short period of time, and I had some dizziness. Did you have trouble talking? No. She says for a couple of weeks she was dizzy on bed rest and got an MRI for a checkup, and with that, news of a second blow. Well, can I tell you, that's what's, that, that was the scary point. I go into the MRI machine, I do that. Then um, I go into a conference room, and my, my husband and my, my daughter and son-in-law are there and all these doctors. So here's what they say. They say, the good news is the can Concussion is totally resolving. Like we told you, it's going to be fine. The bad news is you've developed a clot behind your right ear, and you must immediately go to the hospital because we have to immediately put you on blood thinners. So I went, was there for three days, and then got out. So uh, blood thinners now. Blood thinners, yeah. yeah. For life. Probably, but I don't mind because I don't ever want to have to go through that again. So she I points out a few weeks after the concussion, we saw her testify before Congress. And once again, she's traveling nonstop around the country. So no lingering effects? No lingering effects. Of any kind? No. Nope. You would release your medical records if you ran for president? I would do what other candidates have done, absolutely. And what would you like to say to Carl Rove about <laughs> your brain? That um, I know he was called Bush's brain in one of the books written about him, and uh, I wish him well. <laughs> Still ahead, everything from her age to her marriage, and reliving her most terrifying moment as Secretary of State. My heart was in my throat. When we return. Continue with Hillary Clinton, public and private. Once again, Diane Sawyer. Tonight, there is disagreement about Secretary Clinton's accomplishments at state, but no dispute about her superhuman travel schedule, nearly a million miles. I have come to Alexandria, to Afghanistan, Beijing, Burma, Cairo. 112 countries, the most of any secretary, she says, trying to restore relationships, build coalitions, and weigh in on the importance of human rights. We urge China to protect the rights of... Yet she writes that, once again, media coverage was mostly about how she looked. She laughed, saying someone suggested she call her book The Scrunchy Chronicles. 112 countries, and it's still all about my hair. You know, toward the end of my time as Secretary of State, I was so tired of getting my hair done every day in all kinds of places around the world, often with people who language I didn't speak and they didn't speak mine. I just said, I'm going to let it grow. I'm just going to pull it back. Thank God for scrunchies. I mean, I really was just not yes, going to keep it doing it. It was such an issue for leaders tried to decode what her hairstyles meant. One saying, if it's pulled back, get ready for bad news. Only over time did she seem to override a lot of the distraction, owning her reputation as a kind of global bulldog in pantsuits. This picture of Hillary Clinton texting became an international phenomenon, everyone writing their own versions of what she might be saying. Obama, hey Hill, what you doing? Hillary, running the world. And her book tells how she began to forge a bond with her former rival, the president. After the distance, the wariness, a friendship. It began in Copenhagen when the two of them decided to party crash a secret meeting by the Chinese trying to hide from decisions on global warming. The president and I looked at each other and, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And off we go. Your excellent adventure. Oh, we had an excellent adventure. And we found them. Hey, we go up the staircase and the Chinese security were there. And they tried to prevent us from getting in. Please, please, no, no. please, please. You know, the president got in, I ducked in, and the president goes, we've been looking for you. <laughs> they got a deal with the Chinese, but even she says, far from perfect. She also describes what she says was her proudest moment as secretary with the president. The decision to go in and get Osama bin Laden. The Secretary of Defense initially opposed the plan. The Vice President opposed it. She was one of those who told Obama to go ahead, to do it. And she finally talks about what she was thinking in this famous photo, watching the raid from a transmission as it went down 
my heart was in my throat because we were watching on the video screen what was happening and we saw one of the helicopters uh, tail clip the wall as it tried to get into the compound. This is video from the scene of that chopper set on fire by the SEAL team forced to leave it behind. The operation only became public after Osama bin Laden was killed. You really didn't tell President Clinton about Osama bin Laden? No. No, I mean, I take very seriously the obligations of secrecy. But and didn't he say, you could have told me? Uh, well, no, because he understood. And when President Obama called to tell him, I think the president started by saying something, well, I assume Hillary's told you. And he goes, told me what? You know? But even as Clinton promotes a book about hard choices and what she lists as her achievements around the world, critics say, just look at the reality of the globe tonight. In Iraq, nearly 800 died last month. In Syria, more than 150,000 dead, and the leader Assad digging in. So the question, what was permanent? What did she get done? Look tonight at Syria. 800,000 refugees when you left Assad is retrenching. In Iraq, as we know, Al-Qaeda is mm -hmm. hoisting flags. Let's talk about what was accomplished, and then let's talk about the uh, continuing threats. Tough sanctions on Iran. Uh, that got them to the negotiating table. Now, whether we get an agreement or not, I hope we Do you will. doubt it? I, I think it's going to be very difficult, but it's a lot better than what we inherited, where there was no international consensus and Iran was just, you know, pursuing its nuclear ambitions, including building underground facilities. So, are there still terrible things going on in the world? Yes, there are. I think there is no perfect outcome. It's a constant effort that we're all engaged in. Like the ongoing chess game with Vladimir Putin. We want to reset our relationship. Before Putin returned to office, Clinton showed up in Russia hoping to reset the relationship there. Though in fact, the word on her joke button was wrong. We worked hard to get the right Russian word. You think we got it? You got it wrong. I got it wrong. The word her staff used by mistake was overcharged. And as we all know tonight, Vladimir Putin is on the move and has annexed Crimea. Did you misread Vladimir Putin? Will he ever give Crimea back? Well, I think that depends on whether he's made to pay a price for... You think we should make him give it back? I don't think we are in a position to advocate making him through military action, but I'm a strong supporter of tough sanctions that create an economic cost for Russia and for him personally and his cronies. Just a few days ago, Putin derided Clinton for criticizing him. Vladimir Putin said in a French television interview, it is better not to argue with women. <laughs> he added, weakness is not the worst quality for a woman. Well, I, I saw that and he's not the first male leader who's made a sexist comment like that. Uh, he and I frankly disagree and we have done so publicly. When people say where is the marquee achievement? No sweeping agreements, no signature doctrine. We haven't had a doctrine since containment worked with the Soviet Union, uh, but we've had presidents who've made some tough calls, some hard choices, some of which have worked and some of which have not. Which brings us to Benghazi, an event that has been used to question her leadership ability and could affect her prospects for the presidency. It begins in 2011. She supported overturning the Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. It was even called Hillary's War as she built the coalition to get him out and celebrated at the moment he was captured and died. We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> But even as a lot of the Libyan people were cheering the Americans, did she miss the danger signs? A lethal force about to strike. When we return, nine hours of chaos in Benghazi. Does she take responsibility for missing what was coming? I wonder if people are looking for a sentence that begins from you. I should have. I should have. Coming up. Sawyer continues with Hillary Clinton, public and private. And now, Benghazi. 
We have talked to experts and historians who say this fractious issue could be decisive, making the difference in any Hillary Clinton campaign, raising challenging questions about leadership in a crisis. After 13 hearings on the topic, 25,000 documents have been released. The fierce debate over responsibility rages on. So we begin now on that night her friend, Ambassador Chris Stevens, and three other Americans in Libya lose their lives. Put yourself in the place of the American ambassador on the night of September 11, 2012. Chris Stevens is in a small outpost in the northeastern city of Libya, Benghazi. He's heading off to bed when suddenly, look at this video, coming toward him, dozens of men armed with automatic rifles and rocket-propelled grenades. Stevens and his aide make their way into a fortified room, locking the steel doors. A seasoned ambassador, known for his big, optimistic smile, fighting for his life. Stevens spoke Arabic, was passionate about giving Libyans a better future. I look forward to watching Libya develop equally strong institutions of government. But as he and his aide hide in the fortified room, attackers throw diesel fuel on the building, setting it aflame. Stevens and Sean Smith suffocate in the smoke. Two former Navy SEALs also die that night at a CIA annex nearby, taken down by mortar bombs. In the interview, I show Secretary Clinton a picture of Chris Stevens, the man she chose to be ambassador to Libya. Here's Chris with that amazing smile. The hardest part is to think about Sean Smith and Chris Stevens being trapped. And when I think about that, it just breaks my heart because um, the diplomatic security personnel were performing heroically. But this is the central question asked by her critics. Did she do everything she could or should have done to make that outpost safe on the anniversary of 9-11? His last words in his diary, Chris Stevens, never-ending security threats. Right. But he was there on 9-11. Right. And of his own choosing. But you wanted a post there. It was important to have diplomatic assets. Were there security threats? Yes. And there are there's a long list of countries where there are security threats to American interests. But these were the highest among the highest. No, well, it, it would be in the top 25. It was, it was not. Not in the top five, top 10? Uh, maybe, maybe in the top upper 10, but there were places where we had much more concern. But should she have known the situation in Benghazi was deteriorating fast? A cable in August, a month before the attack, warns about vulnerability. There had been two bomb attacks on the mission in the last six months. The Red Cross had pulled out of Benghazi. The British had left too. You know, the criticism is it was a glaring, flashing red crisis there. The British were pulling out. There had already been attacks. There were cables being sent. Did you miss it? Did you miss the moment to prevent this from happening? No, but I think as the independent board that investigated every aspect of this, including all the cables, uh, concluded, there was uh, a lack of appreciation and response to the level of threat. Now, there were a lot of... By you, too. Well, no, that was never brought to me. She says she did not see that August cable, but she relied on her staff, the security professionals, to do the job. Is there anything you personally should have been doing to make it safer in Benghazi? Well, what I did was give very direct instructions that the people who have the expertise and experience in security a person, apply it. You well, that person. is personal, though, Diane. It, I mean, I am not, um, I'm not equipped to sit and look at blueprints um, to determine where the blast walls need to be or where the reinforcements need to be. That's why we hire people who have that expertise. This is the ARB. Mm -hmm. The mission was far short of standards. Weak perimeter, incomplete fence, video surveillance needed repair. Right. They have said it's a system systemic failure. Well, it was with respect to that compound, and it was not a permanent facility. 
The CIA annex was much, much stronger and had much greater security. Two men died there. But the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, said he was surprised the Secretary of State didn't know about that August cable. Are you stunned that she didn't? Uh, I would call myself surprised that she didn't. Okay. She insists that delegating security to the staff didn't mean she wasn't concerned. But that doesn't mean I wasn't saying all the time, we've got to make sure we secure this spot and that spot. I wonder if people are looking for a sentence that begins from you. I should have. I should have. We saw your face on that tarmac. Something that said, I should have done this differently. I would give anything on the earth to personally if I had, could have done this differently. Well, I certainly would give anything on earth if this had not happened. And I certainly would um, wish that we had made some of the changes that came to our attention to make as a result of the investigation. Um, but I also am uh, clear in my own mind that we had a system and that system, of course, ended with me. Yeah, but I, I take responsibility, but I was not making security decisions. I think it would be a mistake for a Secretary of State to sit and say, okay, let's go through all 270 posts and let me decide what should be done. That, is, that to me, is inappropriate where the experience and the expertise lies elsewhere. But the top 10? Top 10. Top 10, but it's a constantly changing um, scenario. Are you saying it's just the price of doing business to have people in dangerous outposts, even with less than the adequate security that the, that the review boards have said they needed? I'm saying that we have to be very thoughtful as the United States of America where we send people, why we send them, what we expect from them, and how we do the best to protect them. We cannot eliminate every threat, every danger. But there's still another part of the story that has created a firestorm of doubt and criticism. Those first statements by the administration talking about attacks as part of a wave of protesters out of control. Critics believe they were a diversion designed to protect the campaigning president from the charge he failed to stop a terrorist attack on his watch. But you're also eight weeks before an election. Well, this is politics. Well, I mean, I'm shocked that policy and politics are at work in Washington, but that's not what was going on. What was going on was trying in the midst of what frankly was the fog of war to figure out what had happened. You famously said whether it was a protest or a group of guys walking out and deciding to kill some Americans. Americans. What difference at this point does it make? It is That's right. Does and it make a difference? It, in the moment, it did not. In the moment, what we had to be focused on was saving American lives. Does it make a difference now? Do you, well, ch do you want to change that? Do you want to? No, no, I don't. Because the point of what I said at the, at the time was, you know, if you're going to stay fixated on things like talking points or fixated on whether or not everybody was affected or not by the video, you're missing the larger picture. And as we said, after two years and all those hearings, all those documents, Republicans in the House have now announced yet another investigation of Benghazi and Clinton to begin later this year. Are you going to testify? Well, that's going to be up to the people running the hearing. But Same if they ask you? We'll see what they decide to do, how they conduct themselves. But what I do not appreciate is politicizing this at the expense of four dead Americans. That's not what we used to do in this country. When 258 Americans were killed in Beirut in two separate attacks, people mourned. People were shocked. Decisions were made. Bring them out. You know, strengthen the embassy. Is that another reason not to run? No, actually, just too much. Actually, it's more of a reason to run because I do not believe our great country should be playing minor league ball. We ought to be in the majors. And I view this as um, really uh, apart from even a diversion from the hard work that the Congress should be doing about uh, the problems facing our country and the world. We know so many of you are weighing in online right now. Join our group of experts and historians as they weigh in too. Tweet us, go on Facebook. We want to hear what you think. And tomorrow on World News, you will hear from our experts and some of what all of you had to say tonight. We'll be right back. Next, Monica Lewinsky is back in the news. Mm. 
some 18 years later, what does Hillary Clinton know about disappointment and forgiveness when we return? Here once again, Diane Sawyer. Hillary Clinton's house is a reminder of the drama shaping her life. The Chicago girl who became a star of Yale Law School, the transformation into a political wife of a charismatic candidate for governor of Arkansas. It's not an image question so much as a priority question. And then her riveting and mystifying resolve in crisis after crisis. She says she was just living a lesson from her mother, who had been abandoned as a child, worked as a maid and a nanny, but never yielded to the cracks of her hard life while holding the family together. On a table, the book her mother was reading the day she died, bookmarkers still in place. And right here, the table, where she says a secretary of state would come home and tell her mother about the stresses of life. As we sit together, an old stress has returned. An essay in a magazine making headlines and political opponents warning they think the topic is still fair game. Monica Lewinsky mm. is back in the news. Well, she's perfectly free to do that. Uh, she is, in my view, an American who gets to express herself however she chooses. But that's, you know, not something that uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about. Really? Mm, really. Really. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it in my book, Living History. I dealt with it at the time. I have moved on, and that's how I see, you know, my, my life and my future. You're not looking at me thinking... Here she is asking these questions. No, because again. I knew you would. I knew you'd have to. I mean, it's, it's something in the news. You have every right to ask, and I have every right to tell you how I feel. Did you call her a narcissistic loony tune? I am not going to comment on what I did or did not say uh, back in the late 90s. Those words surfaced recently in notes from years ago, written down by her late friend, Diane Blair. For her part, Lewinsky writes that her life was overwhelmed by ridicule. She has said she has lived all these years as a punchline. Is there anything you would say to her about her life? Well, I would wish her well. I hope that she is able to, you know, think about her future and construct a life that she finds uh, meaning and, and satisfaction in. How are you different than you were then? Well, I think the eight years of the presidency taught me a lot. And then my eight years in the Senate, I've tried to become a deeper, more understanding, more open, uh, more grateful person um, as I've gone through these last 20 years. Um, because I don't think we need more political combat in our country. Would you say vast right-wing conspiracy again? Is this vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president? I probably would not because um, I think that it became, a, a, you know, an excuse for not looking at what was uh, clearly a concerted political effort against the Clinton administration, just as we have seen it against the Obama administration. So from this vantage point, a lesson for a younger generation about the choice she made back then? Do what is necessary to be resilient. You know, life is filled with disappointments. And, you know, I've had a blessed life. I mean, I'm sure I've had disappointments and setbacks and all the rest of it, and it's all played out in public and, and for, the first, for the second half of my life. But everybody does. I respect anyone who, when they're knocked down, gets back up. I mean, it's really about just that. And I learned that from my mother, who had a really horrible childhood and was so mistreated and neglected and abused and could have become a whiner, a quitter on life. And she didn't. She kept coming back. And she told me, she said, you know, you can be knocked down eight times, ten times, a hundred times. What matters is whether you get back up. Behind that. I went to retrieve a photo I had seen on one of her tables. A couple who met in the Yale Law Library. She introduced herself, saying, If you're going to keep looking at me and I'm going to keep looking back, we at least ought to know each other. And I'm Hillary Rodham. I'm what's your name? <laughs> couldn't remember my name. We have watched her defend him. I'm sitting here because I love him. 
and I respect him, and I honor what he's been through and what we've been through together. And then becomes Secretary of State with him there at her side. I am um, so grateful to him for a lifetime of uh, all kinds of experiences. <laughs> Somebody said, forgiveness is releasing a prisoner and discovering the prisoner was yourself. I am 100% in the camp that says forgiveness is mostly about the forgiver. I know too many people, having now lived as long as I have, who can never get over it. Forgiveness is a way of opening up the doors again and moving forward, whether it's a personal life or a national life. Back to that photo from the table of a girl in a plain cotton dress on her wedding day. We were poor college professors. We got married in our house and I bought the dress off the rack the night before and we had a friend give us a reception. It was it was wonderful. Is this the happiest time in your marriage? We've had a lot of happy times. We started off, you know, a conversation all those years ago at Yale Law School and 40. it's... 40. Yeah, more. Oh my gosh, so many years ago. It's never stopped and uh, we make each other laugh. We support each other. It's really another one of my blessings. But as we said, it is also a target for the political opposition. A magazine cover once called it the bill factor. Republican Senator Rand Paul made it clear he will use the past in any race for 2016. There is no excuse for that. Republican Rand Paul. So it's fair game. It's fair game to talk about Monica Lewinsky, that it's fair game to talk about how bosses treat people. Mm. You know, he, he can talk about whatever he wants to talk about. And uh, if he decides to run, he'll be fair game, too, for everybody. Next, Hillary Clinton would be the second oldest president in American history. You would be 69 on election day. It matters. Age matters. Coming up. Sawyer continues with Hillary Clinton, public and private. Tonight, Hillary Clinton, 66 years old, wow. is on a schedule almost as taxing as a campaign tour. She and her husband, thanks to some big spenders, including Wall Street companies, are no longer the couple struggling for money. Reportedly, they can charge hundreds of thousands of dollars for speeches. It has been reported you've made five million. Making speeches, the president's made more than a hundred million dollars? Well, if, if you, you have no reason to remember, but we came out of the White House not only dead broke, but in debt. Uh, we had no money when we got there, and we struggled to, you know, piece together the resources for mortgages, for houses, for Chelsea's education. You know, it was not easy. Uh, Bill has worked really hard, and it's been amazing to me. He's worked very hard. First of all, we had to pay off all our debts, which was, you know, you had to make double the money because of, obviously, taxes, and then pay off the debts and get us houses and take care of family members. But do you think Americans can understand five times? the median income in this country for one speech? Well, let me put it this way. I thought making speeches for money was a much better thing than getting connected with any one group or company, as so many people who leave public life do. It has been connecting and empowering and women. she insists her central purpose is still to argue for equality for women and children, which she calls the great unfinished business of our time. My religious faith, growing up in the Methodist Church, really did instill a sense of both possibility and obligation. And so regardless of what specific role I've ever played in the past, I've always felt like if I were healthy and educated and able, you know, I should be out there doing something for others. For girls who need to believe they too can be president and something more than the first lady's dresses can be on exhibit at the Smithsonian. These are the dresses. Yes. And if you run again, will it be? <laughs> that is a great picture. First mate, you said? If that were to ever come to pass, uh, that's a pretty good title. <laughs> she loved the the day is winding down. While she says she's still looking ahead to what is possible and what she would leave behind. I love to swim. Do you have a routine? Do you stick to it? Do you have discipline? 
Not as much as I wish. I probably have as good a sense of how hard the job is as anybody. You see the before and after pictures of these young, vital, incredibly active men and their hair is whiter uh, and the lines are deeper. It's just part of the job. And so I know what's at stake. I know how difficult it is. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna have any illusions uh, when I make the decision. Age. Age, yes. Isn't it great to be our age? I'm I mean, older really, than you are. You are, which of course great nobody... would be your age again. You would be 69 on election day. That's eight months. Mm -hmm. That's eight months younger than Ronald Reagan. Yeah, well... It matters. Age matters. Uh, well, it, it may, depending upon who the person is. You know, my, my mother lived with us until her death at 92, and she was as active and involved and just curious and intellectually capable as people much younger than her. So it's the individual. You know, they have said that Mitch McConnell said at one point, I think to a CPAC, conference that 2016 will be the return of the Golden Girls. That was a very popular, long-running TV series. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back with a note in a minute. Thank you for watching tonight, and just a note about my own life and that of Hillary Clinton. As you heard, we're from the same generation. In fact, we were on the same campus during college, though she was younger than I, and I didn't remember her until, like most of you, I looked up when she was walking into the crucible of her very public life. She said she chose hard choices at the title of her book because it's the headline of her life, and she thinks maybe every other life, too. Hard Choices comes out tomorrow, and you can see much more from our interview tonight on Nightline. And Hillary Clinton sits down tomorrow live with Robin Roberts on Good Morning America. Thank you again for joining us, and good night. Every day, more Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. What will Hillary Clinton be doing tomorrow morning? Well, she's coming live to GMA, face-to-face -face with Robin Roberts. Tomorrow, only on ABC's Good Morning America.